Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with tomato tart. That's right, I've always wanted to visit the south of France, but not because of the famous film festival or those gorgeous clothing optional beaches. No, the real reason I want to visit Provence is so I can enjoy this amazing tart in its natural habitat, preferably accompanied by their equally famous rosé. But anyway, I'm very excited to show you my take on this deceptively simple recipe. And we'll begin that by thawing out some puff pastry, with which we're going to build our freeform rectangular tart shell. And man, this would be way easier if this thing came in a big sheet, like in the restaurants. But it doesn't. So I'm just going to go ahead and press together a couple of these squares to make a rectangle. And I'll just sort of smoosh and press together the seam in the middle. And generally, thawed out puff pastry should be sticky enough to adhere. But if need be, don't be afraid to brush on just a little touch of water. And then what we'll do once our rectangular base is done is cut some strips from the extra pieces and we'll lay those along the edge to make a border. Oh, and stop me if you've heard this one before, but it doesn't matter how bad it looks at this point. As you'll see, once this is baked, it's going to look magnificent, even if you do a fairly mediocre job forming the shell like I'm doing here. So please don't be too stressed doing this because your tart will actually sense that and not taste as good. And then what we're going to do once our base is formed is we're going to go ahead and pop this in the freezer for 10 minutes to firm it back up. Because for the next step, we're going to perform the old, old slash and prick. And that is not going to work out unless our dough is firm. So like I said, we'll pop that in the freezer for about 10 minutes. At which point we're going to take a knife and go around the outside making semi-even slashes. About, I don't know, a quarter inch apart. All the way around, including both ends, which is kind of hard to see. And by doing that, once this is baked, we're going to kind of camouflage where our seams were. And as you'll see, it kind of works. And then what we'll do once that's set is take a fork, and besides give that center seam a little bit of an extra press, we will go ahead and use that fork to prick the bottom all over, which in the world of baking and pastry is not called pricking, it's called docking. And you can go ahead and call it whatever you want. I mean, you are, after all, the Dick Tracy of whether calling it pricking is too racy. And by docking the bottom, it's not going to rise up as much. And once this is cooked and pressed down, it's going to help produce a beautifully crispy bottom which is definitely the kind of bottom we're going to want. And then what we're going to do once that bottom's been properly poked is go ahead and transfer that into the center of a 400 degree oven for about 10 minutes or until it looks a little something like this. Okay, it should be lightly golden and partially puffed. And then what we'll want to do as soon as this comes out while it's still hot is take the back of a fork and press down the bottom of the tart. All right, firmly but gently. And please stay away from our beautiful border. Okay, we're only pressing down the parts we poked. And once this surprisingly fun step is done, you can see we've produced a pretty decent looking tar shell. Except of course for that giant gap in the middle, which yes, was really bothering me. So what I did is rolled up a little ball of dough and then secretly cut off a little crispy corner from the bottom and used that to kind of make a patch. And that really wasn't probably gonna cause much of a problem, but it was bothering me, so I couldn't help myself. And then whether we're making any repairs or not, what we want to do is let this cool for another 10 or 15 minutes before finishing it off, which will give us enough time to pull the rest of our ingredients together. Like, for example, the star of the show, some beautiful, perfectly sweet, summer vine-ripened tomatoes. All right, except no substitutes. All right, it sounds obvious, but I'm going to say it anyway. This tart is only going to be as good as your tomatoes, so make sure you get some nice ones. And then, to make this semi-legit, you're going to want to find some Herbe de Provence which is basically a dried mix of every single herb you've ever heard of, plus a little touch of lavender, which doesn't really sound like it would work, but it really, really does. And then assuming our tart shells cooled down for about 10 minutes or so, we can show you the last major ingredient, and that would be some Dijon mustard. And what we'll do is take three or four generous spoons of that, and we will spread that evenly into the bottom of our shell. And we really do want to be generous with this. Okay, that stuff's going to be our sharp, tangy, sort of spicy liaison, between our crisp buttery crust and our soft sweet tomatoes. And usually at this point, I would tell you to use any mustard you want, but not this time. I need you to use the best, strongest French Dijon you can find. And then what we'll do once we've mustered our crust is go ahead and lay in our sliced tomatoes, which I tried to slice just over a quarter inch thick. And in a perfect world, this would have been wide enough to do two rows of tomatoes, or we could have made our shell smaller and narrower and just fit one row. But this is what I had to deal with. So after putting four whole slices in offset like that, I'll simply go ahead and use some half slices to fill in the gaps, which actually, if I do say so myself, made for a pretty nice presentation. 
But bottom line, one way or another, we want to cover the surface completely without overlapping the tomatoes. And some people like to overlap, but not me because I don't think the tomatoes cook enough that way. So as you can see, I'm going single layer. And then what we'll do once our tomatoes are down is go ahead and season those generously with some French sea salt or the salt of your choice. And we will also do a little touch of freshly ground black pepper, as well as a generous sprinkling of our herbe de Provence, which as I'm applying, I'm kind of rubbing between my fingertips to sort of activate it. And while we do want to be careful applying dried herbs to something like this, because it can potentially overwhelm the other ingredients, we really do want to make sure we apply enough since it is one of the signature flavors. And then what we'll do after we've applied our herbe de Provence is we'll grate over a very light dusting of Parmesan cheese, the real stuff, of course, some Parmigiano Reggiano. And I know you have a French friend that does this and uses Gruyere. That's fine and also delicious. But personally, I do prefer the Parmesan. And then after the cheese, we'll finish this up with a little drizzle of olive oil. And that's it. Once that's been applied, our tomato tart is ready to bake. So let's go ahead and transfer that back into the center of our 400 degree oven for about 25 or 30 minutes or until our pastry is beautifully browned and crispy and our tomatoes look caramelized and amazing. And then all we're gonna to need to do at this point is somehow, some way, let this cool down to room temp, which we can if we want let happen right on this pan. But if you're brave, and more importantly have two spatulas, if we're able to somehow transfer this hot tart onto a cooling rack, that bottom will actually stay a lot crispier once this is finally cooled. So I took a chance and it worked out, and I let it cool on that rack for another 20 minutes or so. At which point we'll get this ready for service with a couple final touches which will include a little extra drizzle of olive oil, as well as some chopped fresh herbs, ideally some of the same ones that are in Herbe de Provence, like parsley and oregano and thyme and some chive like I used here. And that's it, once cooled and decorated, our tomato tart is finally ready to enjoy. And one thing I love so much about this tart, besides everything, is that visually this kind of underpromises, but when you bite in, taste and texture-wise, it totally over-delivers. Like, way over. I mean, the combinations in texture and taste between that crispy, buttery pastry and that tangy, sharp, acidic mustard and that sweet, caramelized, but still juicy tomato is just absolutely stunning and really must be experienced to be believed. I mean, it really doesn't seem possible that something this simple is this delicious, but it is. I mean, it's kind of funny if someone asked me what my all-time favorite tart was and my answer was like the only one that doesn't use fruit. I know, I know, tomato's technically a fruit, and peanuts aren't a nut, they're a bean. And birds are just newer little flying dinosaurs. All right, I know all that, but you know what I'm saying. Of all the tarts in the world, sweet and savory, this is by far my favorite. And I'm enjoying this without a glass of rosé. Oh, by the way, does anyone know if they have a video recipe category in the Cannes Film Festival? Maybe that's my ticket to finally get over there. But anyway, no matter where you enjoy this, or whether you're sipping on a glass of rosé or not, I really do hope you give this amazing tomato tart a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy.